And I'm honored to have two fabulous leaders with us here today, uh, Vitoria Beria and Ambassador Nina Hichigian from two cities, Milan and Los Angeles, that have really been at the center uh, of this crisis. Uh, two cities that have really strong global orientation and that uh, pre-COVID have been prioritizing really the key principles of sustainable development, uh, principles around equity and sustainability uh, in their city strategies and, and what their aspirations were for their citizens. Um, so we're going to hear about their experiences in providing leadership on this crisis uh, and how they're thinking about moving from the immediate response to longer term recovery. But one thing we're particularly interested in exploring today is how cities are cooperating globally during this crisis. This is a global pandemic, uh, a virus that knows no borders, um, and one that has really challenged the multilateral system and the idea of global cooperation. Cities, uh, in addition to taking decisive action, have really been relying upon their own city-to-city -city networks and relationships with counterparts around the world. And we want to explore what that's meant, uh, explore how that's been helpful, and also explore what the challenges um, uh, have been as well. So our hashtag today is uh, city cooperation. You can tweet your reactions and comments as we have this conversation. Uh, you can also ask questions uh, via that hashtag or by emailing um, globalmedia at brookings.edu. Uh, so before we get underway, just a, a, a quick note on bios. Um, Vittoria Beria is the Director for International Affairs at the City of Milan. She served uh, as a United Nations officer in various capacities, so has a great deal of experience in the traditional system of global cooperation, both at the Secretariat headquarters in New York City and in the field. Her work has focused on social and economic development, and she was part of the public-private partnership created by the government of Italy for the World Expo 2015 uh, in Milan uh, before becoming Director of International Affairs at the city. Um, Ambassador Nina Hitian is the first Deputy Mayor of International Affairs for the City of Los Angeles and holds the only such office currently uh, in the United States. She served as U.S. Ambassador to the Association of Southeastern Asian Nations under President Obama and uh, on the staff of the National Security Council during the Clinton administration. Um, uh, so I'd like to turn to, to uh, Vitoria. Uh, and uh, start the conversation. Um, Victoria, can you just talk about the, what's been the role of the city government and your mayor in responding to and, and managing the crisis? And also a little bit about your own experience and the role that you've played uh, during the crisis. Thank you, Tony. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'll, I'll go right into the role of the mayor and the, and the city council. Of the, uh, we, have, uh, we have experienced and, and we continue to experience a very challenging time. The COVID-19 pandemic has been uh, unexpected and very difficult to tackle. Uh, in Italy, the responsibilities and instruments that are related to the management of health crisis in general lie with the national and the regional government. But it's important for people to understand that, that that uh, a plenty of space for, for a city government to take care of its citizens uh, in terms of protections, in terms of uh, having a citizen even better than normal times uh, with adapted services uh, that are the same ones like uh, transportation and waste management and uh, assistance, uh, but become very difficult to manage uh, in lockdown, in a situation of uh, uh, high risk of contagion in a situation in which you have uh, the majority of the population homebound uh, and uh, in, in need of care. So um, there is basically a, a, a shift from normalcy, so-called, to, to a, a new, uh, completely unexpected uh, realm of activity. Uh, this is what we, we uh, tackled and this is what we focused on. Maintain the city in good function. Uh, 
uh, responding to the new needs that were not present before, to the new clients that were autonomous before. I'm thinking, for instance, about the elderly or about a lot of people that used to volunteer and, um, and animate and really support uh, the efforts of uh, uh, civic outreach and, and, and support uh, CT and, and, and were homebound from uh, overnight. Um, this is also why we while we were tackling the emergency and, and still are, the mayor launched something that is called the Mutual Aid Fund uh, of Milan that started right away to think and explore venues and opportunities for uh, uh, both the um, uh, support of citizens during the crisis and the recovery phase after or uh, probably a blending of uh, um, uh, the the recovery and uh, management of the of the emergency. Uh, in my own personal experience with my colleagues, of course, uh, the most important thing is is teamwork. As all of us had to uh, take on additional urgent responsibilities um, and uh, uh, reengineering all the processes to to respond to what the city was uh, was facing um, uh, and and still are unfortunately. And, and in that respect, I mean, you know, traditionally your role is uh, on international affairs. Um, have you have you had to be uh, doing different things rather than just engaging internationally in, in the particular role that you have as you've been part of that team? Uh, it, I would say it's, it's, uh, it's both international engagement on, on other issues. So, for instance, um, I'm helping out the, the emergency team to procure uh, medical equipment uh, from abroad. I'm helping out trying to find information from the cities that went into the management of the pandemic before we did. Uh, of, co of course, we do, it, it goes both ways in the sense that we, we do receive information and support and, uh, and, and knowledge and uh, uh, pass it on to the ones that are coming after us. So we had the misfortune of being the uh, uh, European city very hardly hit uh, by, by the crisis um, and, and uh, uh, so that we can now pass on information and, and knowledge that is uh, uh, very quickly developed because this is a uh, a very complicated uh, uh, phenomenon to, to manage and the learning curve is very very steep and, and, and useful for people to know what they can foresee in terms of uh, the, the various phases of, uh, of the pandemic. Yeah, that's helpful. And we'll, we'll get it, um, should get a, a bit more into what it, what it means to be sharing that knowledge and, and how important it is and how that's been working. Um, but let me turn uh, to you, Nina, and uh, what's been what's been the role of uh, of the mayor, the city government in the crisis in Los Angeles, um, and uh, and tell us also a bit about your own personal experience uh, during the crisis. Great, hi Tony and hi Victoria. It's nice to be with you. Thanks for doing this. Um, let me know if I'm not coming through clearly. Um, so just a few facts about Los Angeles for those who might not be so familiar with the city. Um, we're the second largest city in the US and we have about 4.1 million people. We sit in a county of 10 million people um, and we're extremely diverse. 38% of our population is foreign born. We have some of the largest diaspora uh, communities in the United States and, and in the world. We had the fourth busiest airport pre-pandemic. Um, all of which is to say we're very open to the world and therefore in this case, very vulnerable. Um, also very lucky uh, in terms of cooperation, but uh, in terms of the response and the responsibility of the city and mayor, it's, it's almost impossible to overstate, I would say. We have done just every single thing from setting up our own testing sites to procurement of PPE, which continues to be challenging, converting our manufacturing and our garment industries to 3D, uh, you know, face uh, printing of face shields and sewing masks, um, you know, issuing all the orders for residents to stay at home and to wear masks, turning our convention center into a hospital, creating new child care centers for healthcare workers, uh, imposing an eviction moratorium, ramping up food delivery for seniors, setting guidelines about what businesses can remain open, um, 
which you know are not not too many, um, turning our rec centers into temporary homeless shelters, creating special parking zones uh, outside of restaurants, um, and then raising a lot of money from individuals and foundations to help our most economically uh, devastated residents, um, a sizable proportion of whom are undocumented and so aren't going to get any federal assistance um, whatsoever. And now, of course, we're thinking and researching about how we can open things back up again, which is very, very challenging. And we're doing all these things while trying to communicate in a very um, orderly way with daily press briefings by Mayor Garcetti, which have become you know, a touchstone for many residents here, I think like the like Andrew Cuomo's have for, for many on the East Coast. Um, and we're doing this all while coordinating with the different jurisdictions, not waiting for them to act, but making sure that they, um, that, we're, that we are um, aligned with the county and with the state, um, and then still running the basic functions of the city, like to cash, deterring crime, keeping the power on, keeping the water running and all that stuff. Um, and with a few happy exceptions, say uh, this has been all done without uh, federal help. Um, and personally, I mean, it's very intense, um, but mostly I feel really grateful. Uh, grateful, first of all, to be helping. Um, I think I was most anxious when I, at the very, in the very early days when I wasn't sure how um, my team was gonna fit in. Um, and so, that's just who I am. Like, I, I think I'd feel very uh, nervous if I were not uh, deeply engaged. Um, feel really grateful for living in Los Angeles and in California with leaders who are, you know, making the hard decisions. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and my role has changed and that of my team has changed, but, um, but it's still, you know, it, it, we're just, it's all hands on deck 24 uh, seven kind of a situation. Um, so let's, uh, and, and you know, let me just build on that. Um, it, it is all hands on deck. Um, people are repurposing. You just talked about uh, multiple ways in which uh, you're having to react quickly to situations as they arise. Um, so you have very little time uh, and, and folks are, are you know, wanting to be efficient and and trying to do multiple things at once. Yeah. So what's the role there of city to city cooperation, especially across international borders? Um, how is that useful? Um, how would, uh, what, what are the sorts of things in which you're finding it important to be able to be reaching out to cities like Milan or, or others? Um, what gap is it filling for you, especially because time is of the essence and is so valuable? Why prioritize that? Right. Um, well, let me first uh, talk about the domestic response. Um, and I would say that domestically, we are banding together, um, for example, to call on the federal government to help us with our devastated budgets. Um, so that's one thing that cities are together doing domestically. And sometimes the uh, California cities get together to, to make a point to the governor about, about uh, advice about the way um, some particular program ought to be executed. Um, internationally, I think we found it um, most helpful for comparing best practices. Uh, you know, we're all doing the same you know, more or less doing the same kinds of things, maybe in different ways in different countries. Um, and with a very similar, although maybe slightly staggered um, timeline. So, you know, talking um, to cities who have gone through something right before you have uh, is, you know, been extremely uh, helpful to us. That, that's, uh, that's very helpful. And so what I'm hearing is that there's also city to city cooperation happening on multiple levels. You've got the cities in California um, in, in some ways sharing your uh, experiences and banding together and getting aligned with how you might engage with the state. Uh, the cities across the US also um, how they might engage uh, nationally with the federal government and then also sharing and comparing best practices from cities uh, globally. And so 
Vitoria, I'm presuming, uh, given uh, that the crisis arrived in Milan early on, uh, that you would be one of the cities that uh, others are seeking to learn from and, and gain some of those best practices from. Um, and so I'm, uh, it would be interesting to hear your perspective on city to city cooperation. Uh, you might be you know, hearing from a lot of your counterparts, how do you prioritize that? How do you think about prioritizing that? What, uh, what, uh, what does that city city to cooperation mean for you and, and sort of the gaps it might be filling as well? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Tony. And, and I, I very much agree with what, what Nina said. The, the approach is very similar. Um, uh, for us in Milan, the city-to-city the -city cooperation is, is very much the way we function in general. So I, I would say it has been our natural uh, way to, to approach uh, these crisis management as well. Uh, we didn't think about it. It just came naturally. Uh, both bilaterally uh, with the various cities that, that we have uh, uh, relationships and, and work with, and, and Los Angeles being a, a very important one of them, and, and multilaterally through the various city networks we participate uh, into. Uh, right away, you, you were talking about a possible gap that this would fill. Um, uh, right away, you feel that for us, you uh, filled an information gap uh, because we didn't have the information that we needed to understand how to how to how to react to the crisis, uh, being a little bit in in the front line, mm. but that was very quickly uh, uh, let's say uh, overcome because the the spread of the of the virus was was very very rapid. Uh, at the beginning, it was the Chinese colleagues I must say that that, that turned to us uh, with offer of of information, advice, and and also donations of equipment. And then right away, it was more and more cities uh, calling us uh, to get information and technical support because they, were, they felt they, they had to get as ready as possible, as prepared as possible, and they didn't have the information and, and a clear view of what that would mean uh, uh, at the city level. Uh, so how did, did we prioritize? <laughs> I don't think we did. We felt under an enormous pressure to be able to help others. We felt that being quick and effective was, was key. Um, and uh, um, the more we learned and understood in the various technical uh, areas, very, very technical. I, at some point, I got a, a question, I remember, about the level of, of alcohol in the sanitation of uh, detergents for the street. Of course, this is not something I, I would deal with normally. <laughs> but I got uh, every possible information and I pass it on. Um, we, we really felt uh, that at least, uh, given the, the very bad and sad situation, at least we had to transfer our, our knowledge, our improvised knowledge to fellow cities as quickly as possible to contribute to their prevention mechanism because we, we really felt daily that these would con better contain the virus in their own cities and ultimately this would save lives. So was, uh, was this happening through sort of formal channels, informal channels? How are you, how are you managing and hearing from, from other cities, both from interesting to hear um, uh, your engagement with Chinese cities, for example, where, where the virus started, and then um, wanting to sort of act quickly and efficiently and pragmatically to help other cities that might be seeing this as well. But was this, is this, um, uh, is this uh, spontaneous? Um, is it formal, informal? Is it both? How, how, how is that being managed? I just, I, I think I've, I have to underline that it was extremely quick. It was 24 hours, as Nira said, oh. um, but, but it was both. There are formal dialogue, dialogues taking place. I, I'd say little by little, every single city network has turned into uh, focusing on, on COVID-19, even the one that were reluctant at the beginning and they were saying we, we need to sort of continue with our core mission. Uh, I would say the, 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 the conversation is very much on, on monopolized by COVID-19 now. Uh, 
Um, so the city networks are, are active and are helpful, uh, but there's also, as always, the human factor. So uh, the special access to the people that are involved in, in partnerships that are already ongoing in special projects, uh, in joint uh, initiatives that are colleagues and, and often, uh, very often, like-minded uh, professionals and, and ultimately also friends. So the best example I can think of, and, and it's not because she's involved, is, is something that Nina has, has created, a, a very informal WhatsApp group uh, that is growing uh, with city members every day that has become basically the best outlet of information um, and connects people that especially what she was mentioning before the staggering of, of the phenomenon she is this group is connecting people in cities uh, that are at different stages uh, in the management of the pandemic so um, it, it really gets a flow of information that is extremely useful because even the people that are not facing some problems now from the experience of other, of other cities they do understand what they will be facing tomorrow and they are better prepared to do so so i think this this is a, a very informal but but uh, extremely useful example oh that's really helpful and nina i know that uh Mayor Garcetti, uh, the mayor of Los Angeles, your mayor, um, hosted a gathering of mayors through one of those formal networks, the C40 network, which is a city to city network working on climate issues. These are, these are cities that have made commitments um, uh, around climate emissions, and that's usually the primary focus. But to Vitoria's point, sort of within the crisis, uh, feeling like they needed to be activated and act. Um, so tell us a little bit about how did that meeting come about, um, why, and uh, and what were some of the focus and outcomes of, of that meeting? Yeah, thanks. Um, just to step back a second. So I think that that that's an example of a more formal channel, and I'll talk about that. But just like Victoria, we've had the situations of, you know, one-off um, uh, you know, requests. Uh, I remember I got a call from the, um, or I, I think it was a, uh, a, a WhatsApp maybe from from the from the Toronto Emergency Management Department and tried to find someone in our Emergency Management Department to talk to them. It turned out our head of Emergency Management was willing to talk to their head of Emergency Management, and I I didn't get a readout of that call afterwards, but I'm sure that that was you know extremely uh, useful and practical. And second is this um, you know this WhatsApp group, which is not perfect, you know, you, you, if you were to design something to, to share knowledge, you probably wouldn't design a, you know, a WhatsApp group with everybody asking every kind of question, but it is, but it is extremely useful because you pay attention to the conversations that happened before. And even if they weren't relevant at that point, they become relevant later. Um, and then the C40. So that, that happened very organically. I mean, C40 is a, an organization of, um, nearly 100 megacities, uh, all focused on reducing their emissions. Um, it's a very well-run network. It's robustly staffed. There's people all over the world. Um, and, you know, cities right now, all they're talking about and all they're focused on is COVID. Uh, so being, uh, you know, a network that is all about cities and trying to help cities, you know, it just, it, it, it was natural that they would want to, to turn to help. So the mayor chaired that meeting um, and he's, He's done, an, we, we've done another one since then. Uh, Mayor Sala has joined both of those and then, then there's another one coming up. And I think it was a really profound moment for him on that, on that first call to realize that we're really all in this together. Um, we had Milan on that call, Seoul, London, Jakarta, Accra, Paris, Delhi, Hong Kong, Freetown, Guadalajara, um, you know, so, and then many more as well. Um, all making interventions. Um, I think for that call on a practical level, I think what it was most useful for, and Victoria, you can chime in on this. It, I think it was most useful for the mayors who had not yet seen COVID coming to their, uh, to their cities. And um, I think they, it put them on notice that they had to act even much more quickly than they might think that they would need to act. Um, as my mayor has said many times, like, you know, you're, it, it's not fast enough unless it's not feeling right. If it feels right, it's too late. <laughs> yeah. Victoria, what's the, what's the, what's that experience from your perspective as well? Um, I definitely agree with Nina. It, it was amazing to see over 50 mayors uh, zooming together at the same time and, and being extremely interactive. Um, I, 
I, I, I think something that it's, it's very fair to say is that the city to city collaboration is, a, is an area that is, is, it is, it is very collaborative. It is not a competitive sort of relationship between cities, even, even if there is some competitions, uh, namely when, when you have to, I don't know, compete for sports events or these kind of things. Or uh, but <laughs> on, yeah, exactly. But on average, uh, I always find uh, an extreme openness, uh, a very like-mindedness, I would say. And this comes from the fact that cities across the globe have very similar responsibilities, duties, and needs. So mayors are um, very quick in, in clicking with each other, in, in feeling that they, that they have something to say. It's, it's extremely rare to find two mayors that, that don't hit off and, and, and start discussing about stuff. So obviously, in a situation as challenging as the, as the COVID epidemic, these, uh, we, we saw the, the multiplier effect of this. Um, in our experience, we, we, we went into, the, into that particular meeting having to uh, pro pro probably bring the, the kind of worst information possible in the sense that we, we were the ones to, to, to describe what was happening. And, and at that time, the city was really <laughs> devastated and, and, and it was a very sad and, and difficult uh, situation to explain. But at the same time, we came out from that meeting with the idea that there was such a potential in terms of uh, of, of brain work behind uh, what C40 could do at this at this at this level that uh, it was it was uh, our proposal to create a, a recovery task force, and this is the reason why uh, it is an honor and and at the same time a huge responsibility for for Mayor Sala, uh, the Mayor of Milan, to be adding the, the C40 uh, effort to. Uh, uh, round cities together on on a post COVID uh, recovery. Yeah, that's really interesting. So that, so I'm hearing is se several different things. One is just a feeling of solidarity and of, uh, as you were saying, sort of combined brain power and the understanding of the similar duties and responsibilities, and also um, what that, uh, you know, what the dangers were to everyone's citizens and populace and, and being able to support each other on that. Um, and then to be thinking about uh, what it looks like together, both in terms of the immediate response, but, but what it will look like in terms of recovery. So just one question before, because I want to turn a little bit towards recovery and how we're, we're thinking about that. And we've got questions from, uh, from the registrants and, and from the audience, but um, you talked about sort of uh, both the one-on-one -on -one bilateral relationships in formal channels, the WhatsApp group, and now we're talking a little bit about more, the more formal city-to-city -city networks, C40 set up, you know, pre-COVID. Nina, as you said, uh, a fairly robust network staff, um, uh, you know, worldwide perspective and, and worldwide presence. What's been the intersection with the traditional multilateral system. Vitoria, you served you know, in the United Nations. Uh, uh, Nina, as an ambassador, you obviously intersected with um, sort of the nation state traditional multilateral system. What's been the, how, has there been interaction? What's been the interaction with that? I mean, you're relying on the relationships you have with each other and cooperating globally in that, in that respect. Um, has it intersected or not with, uh, with sort of the tra traditional system? Uh, it'd be great to get your perspectives on that. And, and that's not necessarily the way the system was set up. So that's, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to judge, but it would just be interesting to understand sort of the, the how, how these two different types of global cooperation intersect or not, uh, especially in, in this crisis. Um, Vittoria, just uh, wh whatever perspective you have on that. I mean, the, the one thing I can think of is, is obviously European focus, but for us it's very important to bring the uh, collective views of cities to the European in Union institutions. Um, and this is an example that comes to mind is the fact that, that, uh, that right, uh, with, with the thinking that came from the very hard hit cities of, of Italy and Spain, there was a letter that was recently sent by the mayors of uh, Barcelona, Milan, and together with Amsterdam and, and Paris to the European Union institutions. Uh, basically to say uh, uh, that there's a voice of cities that can be very helpful in, in, in your thinking about how to uh, uh, tackle the crisis collectively, 
earmark financial assistance and, and direct it to, to the cities uh, in discontinuity with the approach that was applied after the last uh, the, the financial crisis, for instance, in 2008. Uh, basically, the mayors wrote, we have gone we have lived through that time. We have learned a lot. The cities have uh, have had the, the 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 duty and and the braveness at the same time to respond at the city level. There's a lot we can contribute. Consider as allies. Uh, this is something definitely that that I can think of in in terms of an engagement, immediate engagement that came through the the midst of the crisis. Uh, that's helpful. Nina, what's your perspective on that? So, what's been the experience uh, from from Los Angeles's point of view? Um, we have, we, you know, we have gotten, um, emails from, you know, like the OECD and, and others that have, you know, compiled, um, uh, you know, guides and things like that, which we haven't had time to read, but, uh, but we, um, but we, we get those. Other than that, I'm just trying, I'm just racking my brain here. I can't really think of an interaction that we've had with the multilateral system. Um, it would be great if, if if we if we did, um, I think there's probably a lot of benefit in in making those channels a bit uh, thicker. Um, I think I, I know that some cities have used. Um, well, I guess we've all in some ways used uh, World Health Organization guidance, um, you know. But for us, I guess it's filtered through the CDC. Um, so so I suppose there's that um, angle, and then you know there. The only other connection that I can think of right now is that I know there are some folks in Los Angeles um, in the uh, in the esports or entertainment world who have done benefit work for the for the WHO, but um, there, I can't think of really a, a particularly direct uh, connection, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, one, one other. The, uh, I, oh, I just to mention one other quick thing which we haven't touched on, um, but there's really a beautiful phenomenon of uh, for us uh, of donations coming from from foreign. Uh, mm -hmm cities and from diaspora communities and sometimes from our local diplomats uh, working with the diaspora community or with their home government. Uh, and so we've gotten, you know, lots of masks and other kinds of PPE equipment from, from various cities. And that's been, um, you know, just a very lovely uh, gesture. And I just wanted to mention that. Well, that, that, uh, I'm glad Same you mentioned that. One of the... Uh, one of the issues I wanted to touch on a little bit was procurement. I mean, both of you raised procurement and the importance of it in getting the supplies that you need actually to be able to respond uh, and ensure that people are protected and, and safe. Uh, what's been the role of the city to city cooperation just in getting the materials uh, that you have? And has there been talk of just sort of global cooperation so that there's less competition and more cooperation in making sure that materials get to where they need to go as well. Um, Nina, is that is that something that, yeah. uh, that you have a perspective on? Yeah, we, you know, um, I love the idea of global cooperation to, for procurement. We, it's the kind of thing that we're so we're scrambling so furiously that we haven't had time to kind of build that sort of a structure. Um, and uh, I mean, it's really challenging in the United States uh, because um, we, you know, we're all going to this. It, well, first of all, there's a flood of uh, of um, offers, uh, most of which turn out to be uh, useless. Um, and and then when we actually have secured supply, we've had the we've had all kinds of issues. Like sometimes we, we've been outbid by other municipalities. Um, sometimes it turns out to be counterfeit. Um, we've had we've heard of nearby, uh, not in our county, but nearby counties where it's seized by FEMA. Um, so it is really, really challenging to to just get the equipment uh, that we need. That just the you know the N95 masks and the gowns and and the gloves and such. Um, I mean, you know, I've at the very least it should be done by a federal. <laughs> it should be done federally, uh, in my in my view. Um, but doing it globally is a is a lovely idea, and and you know we should certainly be thinking about trying to do something like that uh, before the next crisis. Yeah, well, Victoria, it sounds like Milan benefited from uh, from some from Chinese counterparts actually uh, in getting what you needed at the very outset of the crisis as well. 
Yes, I would say mostly from Chinese cities. And, and I think, I mean, looking at it in retrospective, I think uh, it was particularly because at the beginning, they were the, the, probably the only ones that, that understood what was happening and, 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 and saw that we were lost. Uh, but then I must say the support the overwhelming support from cities came from everywhere. We got we got letters and emails and calls, of course, from our long-standing partners. Like we have a, uh, a sister ship uh, relationship with Chicago that is uh, 50 years old, and many other cities in the world. So the usual one, but also cities we were not formally linked with. Uh, they reached out just to say. We feel for you, but you can do it. Uh, we know Milan because of your design, food, culture, and everything. We want to be back. We will be back. We will enjoy being back. Um, uh, the, there was really a stream of support uh, from, from everywhere. And in terms of, of very concrete donations that kept, kept us going for a while, uh, and, and we are extremely grateful to, to our sister uh, cities around the world and, and friend cities around the world for that. Uh, I, I must say it was overwhelming how we got uh, uh, things shipped out of uh, multinationals and at the same time, uh, individual families. Uh, just people that had visited as tourists and were saddened by the images that they saw on TV and, and managed to reach out and send uh, uh, 100 masks. That it, was, it was really, uh, I would say, very, very touching, very, uh, very intense as a feeling. Well, I think it's important that we don't underestimate the uh, feeling of support and solidarity that such relationships bring, especially in a time of such crisis and danger uh, and, and people going through, you know, very difficult times. I'm going to switch a little bit now to some of the questions that I'm seeing from the audience uh, that, are, that are coming out over uh, Twitter. And uh, this is interesting. And uh, one, one is a question around how COVID-19 might be changing how cities see the role or citizens see the role of their cities as a provider of security, which is a role that's generally played by a national government. And, you know, how are you experiencing that? And what's your thoughts on what the long-term implications might be for cities' roles in global affairs because of that? Um, Nina, if you've got a if you've got a perspective. Yeah. Well, I mean. It's really, that's a really interesting question. Um, so I wrote a book with, with Mona Sefen back in 20, uh, 2007, and we identified as, as, the, as the major national security threats, ones that could, could kill your citizens in your, you know, here in the United States. And so uh, pandemics, uh, terrorism, um, climate change were the three major ones that we chose. So if you look at national security in that sense, um, then mayors are directly involved, uh, you know, in, in the response um, uh, on a daily basis. Obviously, you know, the mayors uh, have police and fire under their under their um, uh, command. So, so those are also forces that are on a daily basis, uh, you know, keeping citizens uh, safe. Uh, but, um, but I do think that in the era of of these forces that cross borders, that it's going to be mayors who have to solve the problems. I mean, these are our citizens, they're our neighbors. We, this is our job is when they are being uh, threatened to, to, to act. Um, and, and so, and at the same time, obviously we're urbanizing as a world. Um, and there are more and more people who, who are going to be living in cities. Uh, so I think, um, I think the role of mayors in security are is just going to increase. Victoria, what's your thought about uh, how that also might, um, what's what's the implications of that for cities and how they might have to engage globally uh, and in global conversations and global policies around that? Um, I, I believe the, the, the one of the angle that are extremely interesting to see in this in this crisis and the way we reacted is the communication level so mm. mayors always say uh, we are the closest institutions to people so it doesn't really matter whether uh, some service uh, falls under the purview of, of the of the city itself the citizens expect responses 
the citizens know who you are, where you live, they may <laughs> meet you in the street. I mean, this is, ex it's, it's, it's banal, but it's, it's extremely, uh, it's an image that ex is extremely clear to show how the linkage between local and global really works if you, if you take the point of view of cities. So the knowledge, the fact that cities are knowledgeable and accountable at the same time. Uh, I would say to, to respond to your question, my, 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 think, my, my thinking is that um, we are increasingly mindful of the fact that cities are engaging, are engaging more and more, and also of the fact that this is becoming more uh, evident. Uh, the fact that cities coming together are, there's, are stronger interlocutors can actually strike better deals sometimes with supranational institutions that their own national counterpart um, or federal counterpart. We have in mind the, the tangible results that have been extremely visual, uh, vis visible du uh, during the Paris Agreement process, for instance. Uh, which has uh, which has really opened up. Uh, it, it, it was a paradigm shift in a way of opening up what cities can contribute. So it's not a matter of revendicating power or seat at the table. It's a matter of saying, hey, we are those who concretely know what is going to happen if the COVID-19 hits, if a terrorist attack hits, if there's a natural disaster, if the uh, heat waves will continue in this, in this way. It, it's very factual. Yeah. And to Nina's point, uh, it's also the responsibility of like, First, you've got the responsibility for first responders and for um, for the immediate uh, response of, of what actually happens if and when that when that occurs. Um, how are you cooperating with uh, universities, and are you cooperating also? Are you are you having international organizations, whether they be non governmental or multilateral? that you're cooperating with that normally you might not have had a partnership with? Have, have new things happened uh, with sort of external organizations and stakeholders because of that, of this? Um, Vittoria, is there any examples you would point to? I, I don't think there's anything brand new. Maybe, maybe it's too soon for that. There's mm. definitely strengthening of linkages. Uh, there's definitely, uh, definitely, as Nina was saying before, a streamlining of efforts. So we go uh, very efficiently to those city networks, university partnerships, uh, multilateral cooperation that bring, bring results right away. I, I, I see it more, maybe because the city of Milan was, was really very engaged already, but I see as a deepening of relationships uh, more than widening. Um, maybe we didn't see that, we, we didn't need that. Uh, I, I see it more as, as, a, as a, new, a, a new perspective, like uh, uh, we are part of uh, Eurocities and C40 and the Mayor's Migration Council mm -hmm. and uh, the U20 and, of course, the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. All these things are coming together under the, the pressure and, and at the same time, I don't want to say opportunity, which, which sounds like a too positive word, but the, the, the situation that, that potentially creates a catalyst uh, time period for people to become more open to innovation, to find new solutions, to respond to, pro to problems that are very urgent and, and sometimes uh, tragic, but at the same time uh, open up for, for, for new way of looking at things. Uh, just if we want to, to keep on, on honoring the same commitments that we had before, uh, and, and for us, I would say, namely, if I had to, three, if to, to name the, the three areas that we are most uh, concerned about is the environment, uh, uh, inequality, uh, and, uh, and at this point, very much the health of, of our citizens. Well, let, let's turn to that, and, and uh, as, we, as we think about, you know, what happens next. Uh, and, Nina, you know, I know that as a city government, you're under intense pressure, even just financially right now. And you can talk a little bit about the plan that the mayor has talked about just for city government, um, where uh, I know that you're having to look at furloughs and, and things like that to just be able to manage finances. So in an environment like that, um, you are a city that was very focused on addressing issues of inequality on addressing issues of climate um, and sustainability. You've been one of the leaders, uh, a, a global city in that respect. Um, how do you balance that? And, and are you thinking differently about 
those principles of development and sustainable development as you look toward recovery. Um, I know you're a city that had even, uh, you know, committed to achieving the sustainable development goals, for example, as a city. Um, how do you balance both the, the financial pressure and the, the pressure of getting the economy underway with sort of these principles and commitments and priorities to sustainability? And how are you thinking about that? I mean, that's a giant question. Uh, the mayor addressed it a little bit last night, uh, it was Earth Day yesterday. Um, so he, he talked about it in his, in his daily uh, press conference. Um, and uh, you know, and we're we're going to look forward to Mayor Sala telling us uh, how, how how we balance these things. But we're absolutely committed to balancing them. Um, I mean, you know, putting putting both sustainability and uh, equality uh, at the center of our recovery. As the mayor says, you know, this is not just a time to reopen; it's a time to reimagine. Um, so, in a way, there could be opportunities to to rethink some of the things. Um, that we that we that we wouldn't have before. He has pointed to how clean the air is in Los Angeles right now, um, and how blue the sky is. And uh, so, you know, it, that it's it's not an easy question to answer. Um, all I can tell you is that those well, we're not going to lose sight of those um, of those core principles um, because that's you know who we are as a as a city, um, and you know. There's there's the more kind of nuts and bolts of how you begin to reopen. That's that, and that's the kind of phase we're, um, you know, we hope to be entering in. Um, once our once our uh, you know our cases, um, I mean we've had a we've had a uh, the rate of increase of our of our cases is is getting slower and slower, but they're still increasing um, and deaths are still increasing. Uh, but you know massive testing. Um, I mean I think we've done a pretty amazing job of setting up testing. We can now do 12,200 tests per day and we've done over 120,000, uh, but that's still not enough. Um, and uh, and that's key. The mayor has proposed, along with an, the Oklahoma City mayor, who's a Republican, has proposed something called a CARES Corps, which is, you know, like like the Peace Corps or Teach for America a group of, of, you know, putting, putting um, Putting people to work who who are unemployed now in doing all the contact tracing and tracking, which is a which is a huge job, um, uh, and then we you know we need some monitoring of of how that uh, you know real time somehow of of live uh, cases, and then of course all the R and D that's going to need to go to you know a new uh, you know vaccine and and new new sorts of uh, treatments for the for the disease. So. Uh, and then not to mention an increase in hospital capacity too. So all that stuff we have to get, we have to get right um, as we are beginning to think about, um, or at least can see on the, on the distant horizon, the a time of beginning to reopen. One other thing I'd mentioned is that, you know, we, um, I mentioned it before, but um, it's just worth the, the level of, of economic impact is going to be really intense. We are all going to, the, the city government itself is going to have furloughs and we will probably need to cut some services. Um, but, you know, cities in the United States are a big part of the economic engine uh, of, you know, we think LA County contributes more to national GDP than any other county. But if you take all the big urban areas together, we account for a lot of the economic activity and we are gonna be majorly hurting. Um, we started this program to, um, for, for the lowest income uh, folks in Los Angeles, uh, which has just been raising money from private individuals um, and foundations. And uh, on the first day that we opened it, uh, and this is like cash assistance of like, I, don't, I can't remember the exact figure, like 500 or $1,000, depending on the size of your family. We got 450,000 applicants for those cards uh, from not just LA, but like all around. Um, you have to be an LA resident, but just to give you a level, I mean, there's gonna be very major economic desperation. And so in all this, we're trying um, to to take care of the most vulnerable uh, also. Yeah, well, I can see in an environment in which you're going to have enormous pressure to be able to act quickly uh, and get the get people, um, address people's needs and challenges quickly and get the economy, as you say, jump started quickly. And that's not just important for LA, but as you mentioned, it's important for the country 
as a whole because of the combined power of uh, the urban economy and, and urban GDP. Uh, at the same time, as you're mentioning, and you're being innovative in that, like uh, there's, you know, putting that fund together, you both spoke about funds um, of private donations coming in, but putting that fund together, uh, even putting like the CARES core together where you would take the unemployed and, and get people both back to work, but also being healthy and safe. Uh, so uh, as you, and, and it sounds as if you're still thinking, like, as you said, the next steps are reopening versus long-term uh, recovery, but there's an opportunity to reimagine um, as you as you go. And and Vitoria, I know Milan, you've been starting to think about this a little bit, and then you have even come out with a commitment uh, around um, looking at the clean skies that Nina talked about in LA. I think it's uh, similar in Milan, and it came out with a commitment around um, uh, trying to transform city streets so that you are reducing the car use and keeping the car use low as you come back to recover. So talk a little bit about the, the ways in which you've been thinking about recovery and those three goals that you talked about uh, around the environment, around inequality and health. How are you thinking about that and, and, and trying to integrate that uh, while you also balance the pressures of moving quickly and moving decisively and get the, get the economic activity going again? Yes, yes, thank you, Tani, and, and I, I, I very much uh, uh, share what, what Nina said. Uh, Milan, as the city itself, contributes about 10% of Italian GDP, so there's a huge responsibility to get the economic engine moving, while in fact the situation in terms of uh, the health crisis is not is not very conducive. Um, I believe uh, we, we are all concerned about the potential brutal effects of this crisis, uh, unemployment uh, inequality increasing, economic development interrupted, uh, environmental degradation. These are all potential effects. The mayors are both concerned at the same time motivated to turn these negative uh, experience, let's say, into a catalyst of, of innovation and especially acceleration of the goals that we had uh, with the aim of cities becoming better cities. So these, the, the example you were saying, it, it's a program that is called Open Streets. Uh, it's an acceleration of what we had in mind uh, that mm. it has now been, been uh, optimized. The thinking has been accelerated and optimized by, by the need to think about reopening. Um, I believe the idea behind uh, our our strategy and, and also the idea behind the, 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 the proposal to C40 to have a, a, an ad hoc recovery uh, group is uh, to ensure that we first we do not step back in terms of what we were aiming at before the crisis and we do not leave anybody behind which is uh, uh, easier to say than to do but but the idea is that that uh, if we are if we keep on being guided by the principles uh, that that inform us, as as uh, as Nina was saying, uh, and are more creative and more uh, innovative in the way we turn the uh, constraints and and uh, limitations of this experience in terms of uh, uh, safety and everything um, into opportunities to to change the way the city lives uh, we are talking about changing the the the, the opening hours and the time the, really the timetable of the cities um, moving the cars out of some lanes to get the the cyclists to move uh, along those uh, those lanes and and to create almost uh, uh, so, sort of uh, uh, alternative mass transportation which is uh, individual based um, i'd say that there's a lot that we can do strengthening the ideas that we had before and 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 using them to respond to the new needs and, and I also wanted to say, you, you referred to the SDGs before. I think the SDGs will be the natural framework we will all refer to because they are uh, a North Star in terms of uh, helping us keeping all the interconnectedness of all the, of the, the goals that we will be pursuing together in order to be, as you said, quick and effective in responding to the very demanding needs that we have uh, at the city level now. Uh, well, it's, it, it's uh, inspiring to hear that. And uh, I also imagine that it's a place where 
global cooperation around these particular types of principles and these priorities could be really helpful because it can send a signal to investors, national governments, global institutions, as this is the type of recovery uh, that cities and mayors are really looking for for their citizens. And uh, Victoria, back to the comment that you had made earlier about being closest to your citizens, um, you're sort of channeling the voice uh, on, the, on the global stage. And so um, a, a likely a place where global cooperation could be really helpful. Um, we're, we're coming up uh, on, on, uh, on our time. So I want to ask a, another question that we had gotten from the audience and then, and then just close with uh, give you both uh, an opportunity to provide some final comments. But um, one interesting question that we, and we haven't really touched on this is, is there, how are you thinking about, is there, is there a way that you're thinking about or seeing uh, gender um, as something that it, you need to be sensitive to both in the response and the recovery. Is there, are you incorporating a gender lens in some way in, into this coordination and response? Nina, what's your, what's been the experience in Los Angeles? Because I know that's something that uh, the mayor had even done, you know, executive directives on uh, uh, beforehand uh, pre-COVID, so. Yeah, he is, um, he's uh, has an amazing track record on, on gender uh, equality in city government in terms of equal pay, in terms of, you know, increasing uh, hiring for um, in non-traditional uh, professions like firefighting and uh, computer programming and the like. And uh, I think it's it's really part of how we work. Um, it's integral to how we work. It's he has a gender strategy that goes across all departments and as well as all the mayor's office. So um, there are just a lot of women in leadership. Um, and so uh, I think it's part of how we operate. I'd say in terms of the specifics, um, we, we have a, an odd phenomenon right now where the reported cases of domestic violence are going down, uh, but we suspect that there is more, or the, I should say that the police suspect there is more of it happening. So we've been uh, trying to you know, figure that out and increase, and, at the same time, women are not moving out of domestic uh, shelters the way the domestic abuse shelters the way they were. So we have we've secured hotel rooms again using those private funds, secured um, hotel rooms so that there's more uh, capacity. So that's one specific example, um, as well as like setting up child care centers for healthcare workers is is another particular example that might affect women more. Um, so, but I like to think it's just part of how we operate every day. Oh, that's helpful. So as we close, just um, Vittoria, where do you think Milan might be by year's end? Where would you hope you would be by year's end? And scientifically, I think that's hard to predict. We don't know really what's gonna continue. There's still a lot of uncertainty as to the path of the pandemic and where whether it might even reemerge. But but what are your hopes and, and what are you thinking for Milan by year's end? We, we do really hope to be able to welcome visitors and, and, and tourists and, and people that come and go for business reasons and for culture. Uh, we don't know when, but this is really our, our desire. Uh, Milan is, is a city that has always been extremely open. We are a city with the 27 centuries of history. Um, and, and the idea is to, is to be open and to uh, create and to bring to the city the richness of the outside world. So we are really suffering from from having been cut off this uh, sort of virtual virtuous mechanism. Um, we are very confident on, on the fact that we will bounce back. We know that it's not gonna go, this, the, this will not mean going back to our old normalcy. We look forward to find a new normalcy at some point. There, will, there might be some on and off now we, we will see in terms of the pandemic, but the new normalcy that if we do things right and we have the opportunity to do things right, will put us on a better trajectory than the one we had before the crisis. So this is why we feel that we will be more appreciated and even more attractive in the future. We, we look forward to this. Thank you. Nina, final thoughts from you are also on, on Los Angeles and where, you are, where you're tending towards and hope to be. Uh, I hope that we have done some of that uh, reimagining in a concrete sense of, of how we're going to um, how we're going to go into the future in a slightly different way. Uh, I hope that our most vulnerable 
uh, populations of undocumented and homeless and uh, and just you know people who are very very low income um, have uh, a safety net um, and that we've been able to provide for that um, and uh, and that we can um, you know that that enough businesses have restarted that unemployment is not is maybe in a different way but uh, that unemployment isn't such isn't going to be such a challenge um, and I like Victoria also hope that we can once again uh, welcome uh, visitors and tourists that's also very much part of our of our uh, culture and, and DNA um, so and and that we've we've avoided the the potential spike in fall cases that some people have been talking about because of our you know testing and and tracking system well thanks very much for spending some time with us and for the leadership that uh, both you and your mayors and city governments are providing in this time of crisis um, and uh, I love the sense of optimism and innovation and aspiration uh, that we're ending on. Um, uh, let's make that become viral <laughs> uh, as we go forward. Uh, but thanks very much. This has been a really a rich discussion. And, and thanks for the showing a window and shedding a light on the global cooperation that's happening as well um, and how reinforcing and, and important that is. So thanks very much. And we look forward to, uh, and, and good luck uh, to us all as we go Thank forward. You. Yes, to us all. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Ciao. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.